how can I live the longest thriving? I don't want to just live long and be sitting in a wheelchair drooling and, and wondering who it is that I'm talking to. When we're talking about the topic of longevity, yeah. I firmly believe, and it just seems logical, to talk with people who's actually achieved longevity. And so for, for me, you are one of those people in my mind that I aspire towards and really admire. And also the fact that you're still tweaking and testing and optimizing. And so in the topic of nutrition, I wanna ask you, what are three foods that we need to target overall for the average mm -hmm. person if we want to contribute to more longevity? You know, it's like anything we talk about in this, in this realm, it's a nuanced question with a with a, a complicated answer and I would preface everything by saying that the best thing you can do would be to avoid certain foods in terms of longevity right so if you can avoid industrial seed oils if you can avoid uh, sugar sugar beverages uh, added sugar to whatever it is you're you're eating um, if you can avoid uh, processed grain products those are sort of the first that's the first level of on, of being on the road to longevity. Um, three foods that you can eat, I would say always, uh, number one, a quality source of protein, right? So whether you're, uh, you know, into carnivore and you're eating a lot of steak, uh, lamb, uh, pork, or you're a pescatarian and you eat fish, that's a great source. Um, eggs are a great source of protein. Even if you're a vegetarian, you can probably, you know, mix and match some of your, uh, your bean sources and your rice things and you know that's that's not my that's not my area of expertise and I don't highly recommend it but if that's your thing there's a way to optimize uh, protein intake in that regard Can so you talk a little bit about why that's so important for longevity well I think uh, you know we, we can take a step back and say that longevity uh, you know my idea of longevity is like how can I live the longest thriving I don't want to just live long and be sitting in a wheelchair drooling and, and, and wondering who it is that I'm talking with. So I want, uh, I want to define longevity in certain regards with uh, mobility. I want to be mobile throughout the rest of my life, um, not just to, 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 be, to be able to get around and leave my apartment, if you will, but to travel the world and, and to experience face-to-face -face interactions with people. Um, and then access to cognition, to memory. So if, if, I, if I'm able to access thought and uh, respond to questions and have mental pictures of things that happened to me, not just last week, but 40 years ago. So mobility and cognition are the two uh, big issues there. Um, once, you, once you sort of get over that, that first kind of goal, check that box off, uh, muscle mass is the big... Uh, determining factor of whether your body can keep up with those goals, whether your body can uh, produce uh, enough energy to move around and to be able to maintain a strong, active, lean muscle mass yeah. uh, to pump blood to the brain so that the brain works uh, sufficiently and so that the capillaries within the brain are not clogged up or uh, you know with, with plaque or whatever. So muscle mass becomes uh, an object or an objective. Uh, and how we get muscle mass is by uh, doing work, by, by creating the need for the body to want to build muscle, or at the very least, to want to hold on to muscle, right? So, so our body, <laughs> typically our bodies uh, want to be lazy. They want to conserve energy. They want to sit around all day and do nothing. They don't want to burn fat stores. Our bodies are kind of these survival uh, packages that we have with us. And we sort of have to, to, um, uh, to trick them, if you will, into, um, into doing things that take energy because we know that energy is available. So if we can say, uh, I'm going to go to the gym and lift weights, that's going to prompt my body with certain biochemical responses to the workout whether it's lactic acid or whether it's metabolites of any of the, of the uh, high intensity workout, the genes that I have, the genetic recipe that I have within me will respond by building more muscle or maintaining muscle mass or getting stronger. So these are, um, so the challenge is to, is to figure out what signals uh, are gonna optimize my muscle mass and certainly um, eating protein 
is a uh, integral part of your body's ability to to repair and build muscle once you've done the workout. So doing the workout, sort of step one, and a, I mean a lot of people, and you and I know a lot of people who work out too much. You know, they they think the workout is what's causing the body to respond and 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 build muscle, but it's a combination of that that hormetic event that that short-term stress and a little bit of rest and nutrition and that's where the protein comes in so now you know we want to lift weights we want to increase the amount of protein we take in so that the body responds by either maintaining or building more muscle mass and more strength certainly protein is involved in enzyme uh, creation as well so all the enzymes that are controlling the 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 different uh, biochemical processes going on in the body involve in involve amino acids and protein so it's a um, it's a complex equation and and the muscle mass thing people don't quite grasp like wh like why would muscle mass be so integral to longevity um, I know old people who are skinny and they've you know they've lived a long time and they don't don't appear to have mus much muscle mass well muscle mass um, that part of the equation uh, combined with strength and power is what causes the rest of the organs in the body to have a reason to keep up with the muscles. So it's, it's a little bizarre, but you, the, the brain says, I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to lift weights and I'm going to do curls or I'm going to do squats. And then the signal goes to the body to build, uh, to build these, these muscles up to get stronger, to keep up with the amount of work that the brain is choosing to do. Um, but in the process, um, the body is, is um, trying to, f to figure out how best to utilize all of the organs to achieve this goal. So when you say, I'm going to lift uh, a, a heavy leg dig, the heart goes, Psh, I, I guess I got to beat faster to keep up with the demands that this clown is putting on me right now in the gym. So the heart has to beat stronger. Or if you say, I'm going to go for a, a, a hike or whatever, the heart has to beat stronger. Um, if you are doing intervals, if you're doing uh, high intensity intervals, the lungs have to breathe deeply. And so they have to inspire and they'd have to take in oxygen to provide that oxygen to help fuel the muscles to do the work that you're choosing to do. The liver has to process fuel more efficiently. And so by choosing to do the work and by choosing to use muscle mass and muscle strength as sort of the focal point, everything else comes into play here and you get this complete individual that is now not just strong and able to move around the world and do the things that that people who are older want to do travel the world and have ex access to memories um, but is also in a in a situation where um, you get up in the middle of the night to take a leak and you trip and if you're strong you trip and you, you laugh it off and you walk over and you do when you go back to sleep but if you're if you don't have the muscle mass to if you don't have the balance if you don't if you haven't worked all these systems the typical sad scenario is that the old person gets up in the middle of the night trips falls breaks a hip um, the hip breaks by the way because it's the bone is not strong enough the bone density has been compromised because the person didn't do enough weight-bearing activity to cause the body to want to build stronger bones. You know, you, you got to dig that if, that if you don't go to the gym and you don't do this work, the body goes, hey, don't need to build muscle, don't need the heart to beat that fast, don't need the lungs to, to breathe in that much, don't need the bones to be that strong. Why would I waste valuable resources building strong bones if we're not going to do anything with it? So now the person winds up with a broken hip in the hospital and and the sad trajectory is is typically they get uh, pneumonia in the hospital and they can't they can't cough well enough to you know to to get rid of the sputum and and then the heart can't beat enough to keep up with the demands of the infection because you've only been working at 10 percent of capacity for the last 15 years and so you die of congestive heart failure of die of pneumonia you die, and it and ultimately people die of the you know basically organ failure people don't die of old age they die of whatever organ says i'm out <laughs> whatever whatever organ taps out first so longevity is really this sort of game we play uh of how to maintain muscle mass how to maintain um, aerobic capacity how to maintain 
uh, liver strength, um, uh, we call it vital capacity of the different organs, and vital reserve. And, and if, you, if you understand this basic concept, then it makes sense that you would go to the gym and do squats once a week and do pull-ups and, and do some, a little bit of sprinting. Sorry for the long-winded exp explanation oh, This is fantastic. Here. I mean, you because know? you know our culture is so focused just on the aesthetic part of it yeah. and not really looking at the fact that, and it, we should have known this decades ago, and I think our ancestors did, that muscle is really an endocrine organ, yeah. and it's releasing all of this chemistry. And now we know things like myokines, for example, that when you mention somebody you know, going in and falling ill with pneumonia, and we think about how our muscle even influences our immune system, you know, the list goes on and on and on. And the coolest thing about it is that this is something that we can create. Yes. Like we actually can make more of it and we can maintain it and care for it. But it becomes even more, in a sense, important as we age. Yes. Yeah, no, it, it, like, it becomes your number one job as you age. I would think anyone over the age of 45 would, would be well served to consider fitness and health job number one. And you know you hear these stories about all these people who spent their prime years from 25 to 50 building a business and making a lot of money and sacrificing their health and sacrificing their relationships with their family. And I'm like, dude, life is about enjoyment in in the moment. Um, and the number of people who, you know, you ask them if you could, uh, like people spend a lot of their lives making money and losing their health. And then they're like, I would give out all my money to have my health back. Well, that's not necessary. And that's so, so you should really think of your health as job number one after the age of 45. And, and that means when somebody says, well, I can't, I can't get to the gym every day because I just don't have the time. I'm working too hard. No, job number one is to get to the gym or go outside and walk and make your business calls while you're walking. Uh, or do micro workouts throughout the day where you drop and do 50 air squats or 20 push-ups um, every once in a while or do a plank for two minutes. All that stuff counts. But if you cast it all aside and say, I'll wait till later to do that, sometimes, I'm, I'm not going to say it's too late because we see a lot of people turn around at age 50 and 55 and, and, and start to get healthy again. But, but the, the good news is, I know you know this, as a, as a former you know, athlete, you can coast on the the years that you spent working out between the ages of 20 and 45 you can coast you have to do the work but you can coast for, for the next several decades right so but health has to be it has to be job number one yeah yeah so powerful it's just building a healthy foundation and in particular my son my son and i say this all the time my oldest son if you don't eat you don't grow and so, you know, in particular, if you're talking about having that stimulus with the training, protein is that foundational building block. And so as we age, there's conversations about whether or not we metabolize protein efficiently. But we know that if it's available, your body's yeah. going to do the best job that it possibly can. And so making it available. So we got protein as number one. And we only got to number one so far. Let's That's go to good. number two. We, we got three. We got two Number more two, if we're looking at longevity, yes. what should we be eating? I mean, I would say healthy fats. I, I'd say, you know, a, a good source of energy would be healthy fats, avocados, avocado oil, olive oil. Um, certainly the, the fats that come uh, built in with salmon and certain types of fish, fatty fish, even... Uh, even with with steak and and beef and you know with with lamb and, and and pork, those fats all count. They're all this 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 fear that we've had of saturated fat over the years is unfounded. Now I wouldn't say find ways to add saturated fat to your diet over and above your protein sources, but um, you know mac macadamia nuts, coconut, they have a certain amount of saturated fat. They're healthy. They're they're good. So protein first. Uh, fats second, and then you and I talked uh, offline about this. Uh, I think berries would be the third kind of interesting um, longevity food to include in moderation. And and when I when I say that, I have in mind um, this notion that I don't eat that much bread. I don't eat a lot of carbohydrate in general. I'm just not a carb person, um, so I don't eat a lot of rice. I don't eat a lot of beans. I don't eat a lot. So you know, what do I eat? And what would I choose if I got, again, if I had to choose three foods to live on for the rest of my life, it would be steak, 
and it would be probably you know avocados and and uh, blueberries. All right, if I had to pick three individual kind of foods, and that and that somebody said that's it, that's your menu for the rest of your life. Now, having said that, I try to be as inclusive as possible in what I eat because I love to eat. I like crunchy things. I like crunchy, fatty, salty, sweet. So I'm not suggesting that that these three foods should form the cornerstone of your diet. What I'm suggesting is that, well, you put the pressure on me, Sean, to come (laughs) up with three. I'm going to say, you know, I could maybe narrow it down to 20 foods that I would eat uh, if, if it was limited to just that. And those 20 foods would be enough to satisfy me. Wouldn't be less than 20 because I like, I like, even though I'm mostly carnivore, I like, uh, you talked about Brussels sprouts and bacon. I mean, come on, man, that's an amazing dish. Um, I like different, some different kinds of fruit. Um, you know, every once in a while I'll have uh, a salad. I used to eat salads every day. I don't anymore, but I like the crunch of a salad. Uh, so I want to, I want to be as, as inclusive as possible. Um, knowing that, um, I have the metabolic flexibility to be able to process, you know, any, any type of food, uh, within reason that's on a, that's on a, on a list of natural foods, right? Uh, to be able to process this, extract energy, build muscle from it. The first time that I heard that term was from you years ago. Yeah. And now, of course, it's, it's a popular part of our lexicon now. Right. Can you, being the, the <laughs> father of metabolic flexibility, talk a little bit about what that is and why that matters? Sure. Well, first of all, I'm, I'm not the father of metabolic flexibility, but I like to think that I help popularize the term because it's a very important... S- stepdad. Stepdad. There you go. Because um, Rob Wolf was talking about it uh, at the same time I was, and, yeah. and, and, and we both recognized that... Okay, so we've got... Mark Wahlberg and Will Ferrell, Daddy's Home. All right, so you guys are the stepdads together. Okay, there you go. Okay, uh, put it all in context. Now, now I have a picture. I'm going to put your faces on their bodies <laughs> on the funny. cover of the movie. That's funny. Um, yeah. So, so metabolic flexibility describes uh, a condition of the body, a healthy metabolic state, where you're able to extract energy from whatever substrate is called upon for the work involved at the time. What that means is that you can burn fat when throughout the day when, when no other real work is, is necessary. You can derive 95% of all of your energy just from, from either the fat on your plate of food or the fat stored on your body uh, if you're metabolically flexible. When you go to the gym, if you need to do um, glycolytic work, you, can, you, you, know, you don't really ever lose your ability to burn uh, glucose, carbs, glycogen, but, but you're more efficient at, at burning these. Um, you can, you can, you become metabolically efficient in that you can utilize the ketones that are produced, uh, through, uh, a, a byproduct of fat metabolism in the liver. And these ketones can offset your need for eating glucose or eating carbohydrates. So you become adept at eating the fat on the plate of food, the fat on your body, the glycogen in your muscles, the glucose in your bloodstream, the carbohydrate in your plate of food the um the ketones that your liver makes and even to a certain extent the some of the proteins that you consume some of the amino acids you consume now that's an inef- the amino acid part of this is very inefficient amino acids and protein should be considered structural and i don't i i never understood why they even assigned a caloric value to protein like i i don't want to burn it uh, you know, I want to. I want to store it as muscle. I want to keep it. I want to utilize it for the structural uh, protein content that it's going to provide me. So, anyway, so that so this metabolic flexibility then describes a condition in which you really, you it, when you're metabolically flexible, you don't need to eat that much. And that's one of the great revelations is that you think, well, uh, I need a hundred, you know. 50 grams of protein a day. I need 300 or 500 grams of carbs because I'm an athlete. I used to eat a thousand grams of carbs. Um, I need all this fat. Um, yeah, you can you can eat it and you can consume it, but you don't need it. When be, when you become metabolically flexible and metabolically efficient, you realize that your body works very well off whatever stored body fat you have. Um, your your um, if you restrict carbohydrates and lower insulin, you upregulate these enzymes and these uh, these gene signaling that preserves amino acids, preserves muscle tissue. 
So you can go periods of time, four, five, six days, without eating at all and just consuming water and not lose much in the way of muscle mass and have all the energy you want, not, you know, have, uh, not get sick, not be hungry. Um, it's, it's amazing how the body has this self-contained little apparatus that if you've trained it well, if you've become metabolically flexible and metabolically efficient, you literally don't need that many calories to thrive throughout the day. And, and it's such uh, an empowering uh, feeling to, to get there. And so what, we, what I've done in a lot of my books, whether it was a keto reset diet or, um, or two meals a day, was utilize some of these strategies like, part, uh, like a six-week ketogenic strategy, not the rest of your life in ketosis, but six weeks of, of, of a ketogenic diet to upregulate, to, to increase what we call mitochondrial biogenesis, build more mitochondria, which is where the fat is combusted. Um, two meals a day was how do, you, how do you use the periods of time when you're not eating, when you're fasting, to, uh, again, to upregulate mitochondrial biogenesis, to, uh, to have the body respond by creating an efficient use of ketones such that at some point... Uh, when you become keto adapted, you're so it, not just good at making ketones. Anybody can make ketones. The liver does it all the time. If you've ever been around a, a carbohydrate centric, we, we, we used to call them sugar burners, you know, but it, which is most people uh, for any length of time, if they skip uh, a, a day of eating, you can smell the ketones on their breath. Well, how is that? Well, first of all, that's because the liver is making ketones. That's what it does in the absence of glucose. But because the body hasn't become adapted, isn't familiar with how to do that, it spills the ketones out into the urine and into the breath and into the sweat. When you, when you become keto adapted, the liver goes, hey, I, I know how to handle this. Like, I don't need ketones for the muscles. The muscles know how to burn fat and glucose and, gl and glycogen. I only need ketones for the brain. And because the brain cruises along at a steady rate of energy utilization all day long, the liver doesn't have to surge with giant amounts of ketones because you're playing in a chess tournament. You know what I mean? So, so you could like you could be doing a heavy leg day and your met rate goes up to 40x and your legs are using, you know, uh, what would amount what would equate to 3,000 calories an hour. You're not doing an hour's worth of work, but for the amount of time that you're doing it, while you're doing this, the brain is just cruising along at maybe, um, you know, 25 calories an hour, something like that. And all of that can be can be uh, uh, fueled by ketones. So in in ketosis and in the absence of glucose, the only when you become again metabolically efficient, the body says, "Why would I even waste ketones? I'm making I'm making 25 calories an hour worth of ketones. That's a couple of grams." Uh, an hour, the, the body can make 750 calories a day worth of ketones if called upon to do it. So we have all these amazing built-in mechanisms in the genetic recipe yeah. that we can tap into and call upon to, to um, preserve muscle mass, to burn off excess body fat that we don't need, to maintain energy, maintain, uh, to, to not get sick, maintain an immune system, um, and most importantly, not be at the effect of hunger all the time yeah yeah you know our bodies are you're just highlighting how smart our body our bodies are you know when given the opportunity and if you think about how we evolved this is something that we are acclimated to do which is to use different fuel sources but what if we handicap ourselves under the guise of like an idealistic diet where we're keto for life and then we you know have a phase where for example where we go and we're fasting and the only thing we have access to now is an orange and we eat that orange and we pass the fuck out <laughs> because you know our body is just not adapted to eating these carbohydrates right so we want to what i'm hearing is we want to keep those pathways open and intelligent to utilize different food sources because that's how we're hardwired now of course there are caveats here there's a spectrum if you got inuit dna in you you know maybe the, the high fat protocol can work more gracefully, but for the majority of us, it's going to be a, a spectrum. And you know, you've seen this. There's you. You said that, sent this over in an email. There's been this pendulum swing, and we become even when we get into something that is far healthier than the standard American diet, we can become dogmatic about that thing. Yep. And this is the end all be all. 
And now we're, and I, this is where I see you're at. You're getting to a place of in, inclusiveness and rationality mm -hmm. and even kind of pushing back against people using some of the stuff that you popularized and then creating a prison for themselves yep. and advocating that prison for others. You know, it comes down to a basic question, which is philosophically, like, why do I do all the stuff I do? Like, like, why am I involved in this exploration? And, and the simple answer is, I just want to enjoy life. I just want to extract the greatest amount of fulfillment, pleasure, joy, satisfaction out of every possible moment. And, and for me, that includes enjoying food. So I don't want to, I don't want to say, I'm doing this and I'm giving up all my hedonistic uh, tendencies with regard to food just so I can live another um, two months, maybe <laughs> at the end of my life, yeah. right? I'm doing this because I want to feel good. I want to feel happy. I want to feel uh, fulfilled. I want to feel energetic. And if I can do that by in being as inclusive as possible. So I'll take it outside of diet for a second and just say like, uh, I spent much of my life uh, chasing performance as an endurance athlete. And, uh, you know, why did I do that? I mean, uh, you could go deep into my psyche. I could spend 20 years on a therapist's couch and, and maybe give you some, some ideas. But, but my life was driven by performance. And every day I got up and I managed discomfort. I literally went out and trained in an uncomfortable manner uh, so that one day I could race at a really uncomfortable level. Now think about that for a second. If I'd been playing basketball or baseball or football or hockey or soccer, at least I'd be having some fun, right? <laughs> uh, I'd be on a team and there'd be camaraderie and there'd be the joy of scoring a goal or the, or the heartbreak of, of missing one. But with, with endurance competition, all you're doing is managing discomfort. How do I feel? Okay, I feel like I'm going to hit the wall, but if I slow it down a little bit, I'll lose, I'll drop off the pace, so I can't do that. I got to make myself hurt even more. Well, it wasn't until years after I retired from competition that I that I understood that, and um, thankfully, I lost my mojo, so I have no interest in competing. Even, even though I could probably go crush it in my age group, I'm turning 70 in a couple of months, and I, I'm pretty sure I could... I could jump in in an endurance contest and do pretty well. Smoke everybody. Let's yeah. be honest. I don't want to. It hurts too much. I don't want to. Yeah. So so now my my joy is in riding a fat bike and in you know a highly inflated uh, uh, tire bike, big tire bike, on the sand in Miami Beach with friends, or going out for a paddle and hanging out with dolphins or hammerhead sharks or you know manatees. Um, I I love ultimate frisbee. It's like it's called ultimate for a reason it's one of the greatest games ever invented um and so my my idea of of working out has become less about the gym and the reps and the prs and more about uh the fun and the play because yeah. i did a one of the first talks i ever gave at the ancestral health symposium was on play and how important play was to human development, how we lose it as, a, as adults. And I had lost my sense of play. So now back to the question, which is, you know, um, with regard to food, I'm inclusive. I try, to, I try to include as many things as possible that I know aren't gonna conflict with my overarching theme about metabolic flexibility. With regard to working out, I try to include many things that are as fun as possible that I can also tell you are still adding to my overall readiness for life right so when i'm when i'm paddling uh, a stand-up paddleboard i'm i'm working hard i usually got a, a a speaker on my on my board and i'm playing uh uh southern rock from the 70s uh to the chagrin of all the people living on the canal <laughs> um Down on the <laughs> but i'm but I'm, I'm i'm working core and upper body and i'm the great one of the great things about paddling i I wore a heart monitor one time. That's all I needed to, to realize that I was working my ass off and my heart wasn't working that hard because the muscles were, I was doing like 2,000 reps per side of a full body exercise, right? Mm. So that that's fun for me. Um, the cycling, I can get my heart rate way up on a bike now, uh, which is, which is uh, I had to take 10 years off of that because I got, I got heart issues from all of the years of training I did as an endurance athlete. Mm. But I'm back to 
to uh, full capability there. Um, you know, I'm trying to keep up with 20 somethings and 30 somethings on the on the frisbee pitch when I'm playing ultimate. It's, it's more and more difficult. I got to tell you, there is the body does eventually say, you know, you, you, maybe it's inappropriate for you, for you to go play another game of this. I want to play one more game of ultimate when I'm in my 70s. But I'm having fun, and 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 I'm trying to be, um, you know, as uh, as inclusive as I can. So that I was just in Hawaii for a week with my with my daughter and and grandchildren, and my grandchildren are, you know, JJ's three and a half now. She's running all over the place. You got to do animal flow shit around her because you got to get up off the ground and get back down on the ground. Yeah. And, you know, sit cross legged and, and and put stickers on your face and all this stuff. I want to be able to do that, and so all of my training is contemplated to improve the quality of life, not just adding 20 pounds to my bench press, not just um, taking 10 minutes off my uh, marathon time, but, but, but life, enjoying life. Yeah. There's this great quote that says, we don't stop playing because we get older. We get older because we stop playing. Absolutely. You know, and yeah. you know, what another thing that I'm really picking up from you is being able to diversify even with our play, you know, and we can find joy in so many new things, you know, like there's a season for so much and, you know, there's a there's a lot for us to look forward to. You also mentioned something and I don't want to look past this. We want to also give our bodies the opportunity to use our stored body fat, you know, and so by our state of constant consumption that we have today and also the programming you yep. know when i went to college like they were pushing this into us of eating you know all of these different meals and snacks and of course like hitting this marker you know this was a food pyramid days of mm. like seven to eleven servings of grains like it's just constant yep. consumption right so giving and you mentioned our muscles having the capacity to burn fat and it made me remember there's a type of fat that I wasn't taught about in school, which is intramuscular fat. It's it's there, it's used for on-site energy by the muscle. But if we're not metabolically flexible, you know, that piece and also just even with our, our body's ability to utilize these different systems, we can have the advent of, quote, chubby muscles. Yeah. You know what I mean? So if if we think about what that looks like, it's like the marbling of a steak. Yeah. You know, like we we've got this meat suit inside under this, you know, under the skin and we're so intelligently designed, but I'm so grateful that you brought up this this important concept or like reality of play. I think this is also another reason why grandkids are so important and why grandparents become so popular with yes. grandkids yeah. because there's that element of added play and fun that comes along. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm enjoying the process and it gets better Every day, and I tell this to young parents too. I'm like, I mean, it being a parent is the greatest thing you can do, I think. And and it's trying and it's and it's challenging, but it gets better. I think it gets better every day, at least for the first 25 years. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and and in my case, it's gotten better every day, e ever since. Same with grandchildren. It's like um, it's just amazing. It's also amazing to be able to hand them back at the end of two hours and go, okay. <laughs> Life hack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's your nap time, isn't it? <laughs> no, it's my nap time. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, another big aspect of longevity that you are dedicated to right now and pushing into culture is foot health. Yeah. And you shared that foot health is the literal and figural foundation of overall health. Yeah. Talk about that. Well, as we talked uh, in the first opening segment here, you know, uh, our ability to move, our, our mobility, our ability to, to, to uh, cross the room, cross the state, cross the country, uh, go around the world and experience experiences uh, are what make, give life a tremendous amount of, of quality. Um, all of the movement that we do in the gym sort of is based around around foot health all of the things that we do walking and hiking and playing sports it's all based around foot health it's all based around uh how strong your feet are as a foundation and then how that translate how the information look uh we evolved barefoot and and we spent two and a half million years as bipedal barefoot creatures um with a uh this organ that senses changes in terrain 
and immediately feeds information to the brain on how to flex the ankle, how to bend the knee, how to torque the hip, how to, um, uh, how to absorb shock on a downhill. All of this information, uh, the brain is, is ready, willing, and able as a processor to, to distribute throughout the body. And, and then here we are wearing thick shoes that, that negate all of the sensory information. And we wear these thick shoes in the, in the name of, uh, they're, you know, they're, they're more comfortable, they're cushiony, they're whatever. Um, or we have, uh, high arches in our shoes because, uh, somebody said a while back, well, I guess, I guess we should support the arch because some people have collapsed arches. Well, most people who, ha who have bad arches have arches because they haven't worked those muscles of the feet. So it's, it's become clear that modern footwear has not served us well. And uh, I've looked at this over the years. I've been a, a big fan of minimalist footwear for almost 20 years. I was an early adopter of one of the other five-toed shoe companies. Um, it was, a, a, I think, a good idea, but not great on the execution. I think they, they looked a little weird. And so I thought, well, how can I come up with a shoe that, in, that, that sort of synthesizes or embraces the best elements of, of um, minimalist footwear, including individual toe boxes, what we call the individually articulated toe box, can, um, melds that with a good looking uh, shoe, a comfortable shoe that has a, uh, an attractive upper, a stylish, if you will, upper, um, to the point that people would want to wear these around all day long through whatever activity they're doing throughout the day. So, so my company, which is called Peluva, P-E-L-U-V-A, uh, we make shoes that are designed not to run in. We think that if you want to run, go put on your running shoes. If you want to play basketball, put on your basketball shoes. But we make the shoes that you're going to wear throughout the day, doing your errands, dropping the kids off at school, going to the gym, going to yoga, uh, hiking. Um, if you want to walk six, eight miles on pavement, the shoes are, are designed to have just enough cushion that you, 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 know, you don't get the sort of uh, bruising element of, of being on hard surfaces all day long. But, but, but certainly enough that you can walk on any uneven surface and feel what's underneath, feel the, the rock changes or the formation or the roots or the, you know, the shift in, in terrain and allow that information to go directly to the brain so that, you're, so that you, your body moves according to the information it gets from the sensory input from the feet. Yeah, it's, it's so important. It's literally from, we're talking about the ground up and having a healthy foundation. It's so crazy that we don't think about this, you know, and you know this, there's so many issues related to ankles and knee pain and hip stuff and going up the spine, neck stuff, yes. because of the shoes that we're wearing. And so, for example, you know, having that access, there are certain sensory points in the foot, like there's like a input that it's taking in and sending signals, like keeping your body organized. And like, for and by the way, everybody listening, this doesn't mean you can't wear. He, you just even said it. You know, put on your running shoes yeah. if you're gonna go out. You know, black, black dress. You know, yeah. the little black dress scenario. Girls, and you're gonna wear girls some. Don't throw those heels away. You know, <laughs> it's. But what are you doing the majority of the time? Yeah. Yeah. You know, you wouldn't throw on some of these Air Max, for example. Even if you're doing, from my perspective, cross training. You know, these are more just like a fashion thing. You throw these on. Maybe you could walk a little bit. But there's something abnormal about it. And as soon as you put them on, you know it. Same thing with high heels. I mean, you can get adapted, yeah. you know, but what is that doing to the actual structure of your foot? You know, and so you got me some of your shoes early and I had the opportunity to wear them and they're by far the best as far as like having an individual toe box mm -hmm. shoe. I mean, I can't even stress like they're in another league yeah. of their own. Like I truly, like that. you really Thanks. nailed it. Yeah, and I really want you to put them through the paces too, obviously. Now, the individual toe box thing is interesting because there are companies that make a wide toe box, minimalist shoe, right? There are some great companies making. Um, but but the, the difference is with an individual toe box, the toes can move up and down individually, whereas, whereas one full, you know, regular wide box shoe they all have to move together. So now we want to be able to sort of isolate, like you want to be able to push off the big toe, right? And you can't do that in a regular toe box shoe. So the, the, the ability of the toes to go up and down is I think integral to what we do. So we call it toe splay and, and toe articulation uh, because that's the thing that's been missing from most people. Um, now with, with other minimalist shoes, they'll say, well, you know, if they're not, 
uh, if they're more than say four or five millimeters in in stack height, you know, from the heel to the to the surface of the ground, then they're not minimalist anymore. Well, we're saying no. That's you know, we we ours are eleven millimeters stack height, which is again just a little bit more than one centimeter, with zero drop. So there's no drop from the heel to the to the metatarsal or to the toes, um, and there's no there's no arch support. Why is there no arch support? Well, because we, we'd like you to use the small muscles of your feet throughout the day. And again, if you're not running, then just walking in these will help with mobility and will help with strengthening the small muscles of your feet to the extent that when you do put on your athletic shoes, your feet will thank you for that, for having become a little bit, a little bit stronger as a result. Yeah, it's pretty remarkable how quickly your feet can come back online. You know, I remember working with a physical therapist friend of mine, shout out to Dan, if you're listening, and he was sharing with me that we should be able to individually, just like we could lift our fingers, we could individually lift our toes, you know, when we put our foot on the ground. And, you know, he had me put the phone down on the, we were doing a remote session on the ground and he was surprised that I was able to do it. He was like, whoa, that's pretty advanced. Um, it wasn't perfect, by the yeah, way, yeah, yeah. but that it can get sleepy, that ability. And when I put your shoes on, I immediately, you know, not immediately, but just after walking around in it, I could start to do it in the shoe itself, mm -hmm. right? And then when I took the shoe off, like I was able to just fire those toes, you know, one at a time and kind right. of like my brain is able to talk to my feet right. better. And it's so crazy because it's just telling me that there's an intelligence that is back online that's gonna support me, make sure that I'm safe and functional. When you talked earlier about the phenomenon of, of falling, mm -hmm. you know, as we get older, and being more basically more brittle and yeah. more susceptible to these kind of things. A huge part of this is, you know, proprioception, right? Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so proprioception again is 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 that ability that you have to sense changes in in, in ground underneath you and to be able to um, uh, adapt to changes not just in surface but in um, in elevation. Uh, so, you know, you, you think about that person we talked about, the iconic trip in the middle of the night kind of person. Typically, their feet are not very strong, and so they've, been, they've, they've become atrophied to the point, I hate to use the term, but they're like stumps. They're literally like you're, like you're, you're activating knees in the calf, but the feet are just like stumps that you're like, like, like walking on. And you want them to be grabbing the ground. You literally want toes to be able to, to grab the ground. If you've ever surfed, um, uh, you know, your feet... Can, can control the surfboard by, by literally gripping the top of the board. That's why they wax the board sometimes, all the time. Um, and that's why you don't see reindeer surfing. <laughs> so, there you go. <laughs> we got hooves out here. That's yeah, what we're yeah. doing to ourselves. No, exactly. So, so the proprioception is, again, it's this thing that we've, this, that we're all, you know, we, we have this recipe within us to be able to take advantage of this and we lose it. We just sort of bypass it and think, well, in the interest of, uh, I, like a lot of people have bunions. Well, the bunions are a problem from from too restrictive shoes, from shoes that are being feet that are being toes they're being scrunched together. Now you get bunions, and then you think, well, now I have to have comfortable shoes because my bunions hurt. So I'm going to get big, thick, you know, uh, wide toe box, uh, cushiony shoes, and all that does is sort of exacerbate the issue. So. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to get too, um, you know, too, too medical here on what we're doing. We're, we wanted a shoe that was comfortable, functional, and stylish. Uh, and that was, that's what we've created. And so I think, you know, we're already, we're already having a lot of uh, amazing feedback from people who couldn't even put them on the first time. Like, how do I get my toes into each individual toe box? By the fourth or fifth time, it's like, they slide right in. Yeah, yeah. Can you share their website? Yeah, it's paluva.com, P-E-L-U-V-A dot C-O-M dot com. Um, and uh, I'm, the, I'm the founder along with my son, Kyle. Uh, we're having a blast doing this. And, uh, you know, we, we just, my, my whole thing with, uh, with Primal Kitchen Foods was to change the way the world eats. We want the world to reimagine the way the world, the, the, the world walks. I love it. Yeah. I love it. So earlier you said something that I want to circle back to. You, you said the C word. You said calories, <laughs> all right? You said calories and you also mentioned protein in that, con in that context, maybe being negligible or like the way that we see protein and just fitting into that calorie matrix might be inappropriate. Yes. 
I want to talk more about that because we even know, for example, one of the things I was taught in this expensive education that I got that was almost worthless was this thermogenic effect yes. of protein. But we really, it just stopped there. It's just like, it has this capacity, but right, we don't right. really understand what that means. You know, well, the thermogenic effect of protein might even be an anti-calorie. So if you say, well, um, protein has four calories per gram, that's in a combustion chamber. That's like if you burn it. Well, I don't want to combust protein. I have, I, I'm already very good at burning fat. I'm really good at burning glycogen and glucose. Um, I'm, I'm very adept at burning uh, ketones. Why would I want to burn this, this uh, substrate that isn't really an energy substrate except in emergency situations, right? So um, one, of the, one of the issues I've always had with uh, the old standard American diet and the old mantra that uh, eat six small meals a day, right? So don't ever go two or three hours without eating or you'll cannibalize your muscle tissue. Do you remember that? Yeah, From the course, bodybuilding days, right? And so people carry Tupper, Tupperware around with them with 20 grams of protein and 20 grams of carbs mixed together. And so it was, it was literally a chicken breast, skinless, boneless chicken breast with white rice, right? And it's sort of in the name of, of not getting into this cannibal cannibalization. Well, what does that mean? Well, if you haven't become good at burning fat, if you haven't become adept at utilizing uh, ketones, then your body only knows carbs. It only knows glucose or glycogen as a, as a fuel. And so in any sort of emergency situation, the brain is going to go, where is my glucose? Um, if you skip a meal or if you, you know, um, wake up the next morning from a long sleep and you've got a flight to catch and you and you don't. The brain goes, where's my glucose? I don't know how to burn ketones well. I haven't become used to it. I'm not metabolically flexible, so I can't really burn fat. So where am I going to get my glucose? And the brain gets freaky. It, freak, it doesn't get freaky. That's a different <laughs> But it freaks out. And it, and, it, and it will send a signal to the adrenals. And the adrenals secrete cortisol. And the cortisol then basically goes and strips amino acids off of muscle tissue. It literally cannibalizes muscle tissue to take a few amino acids that it would send to the liver to make glucose to make the brain happy. So in the old paradigm of being not fat adapted, of not being metabolically flexible, the old paradigm, yes, if you went hours without eating, you literally could cannibalize your muscle tissue, right? So, so in that context, muscle tissue has a caloric value. But we don't want to go there. We want to be metabolically flexible. We want to be metabolically efficient. And we want the protein that we take in to not be combusted, if we can help it, and to be uh, utilized for these structural, these structural proteins. So that's the, that's the essence of the, the protein discussion. Now, the thermogenic effect of protein, if you eat, if you eat a lot of protein, uh, more than your body needs, uh, the body has a way of of increasing thermogenesis. It has a way of increasing the 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 metabolism such that you will burn off excess calories. And if you really, some call it the meat sweats. Yeah, and if you're really good at this, um, you know you don't you don't gain body fat, and you're one of those people who can brag about eating four thousand or five thousand calories a day and not looking any different. And to to that, I'm going to say. Okay, you can do that, but is that a good thing? You know, the fact you can get away with it doesn't mean it's good for you. And most people can't get away with that. So most people who overeat will will put on body fat, and it's you know a, a pound, two pounds a year, three pounds a year doesn't sound like much at a time, but over decades it becomes fifty pounds. So the so the thermogenic effect of protein sometimes it is uh, if you if you consume too much protein. Uh, the body wants to deaminate and, and, and piss out the amino acids. That's fine, but that's a process. It takes energy. Um, it, it may want to, you know, it want to, it will want to convert some of the amino acids into, uh, into glucose. That's the, the, the gluconeogenesis aspect of excess protein intake. So what happens is we find this sort of sweet spot where, um, Anything less than 80 grams of protein a day on a regular basis probably doesn't serve you that well. But anything more than 130 or 140 grams a day probably also doesn't serve you that well. Now, it's not again, it's not going to kill you. It's not going to harm you. But it just isn't necessary. 
So the fact that you can get away with eating 200 grams of protein a day, like Sean Baker or <laughs> some of these guys that, great, go for it. But, you know, he's a big guy and, and, and he's, you know, doing a lot of work. But, but I find that there's just, for most people, for 90% of people, there's a narrow range of protein intake that from 80 to 120 grams a day that, that you would thrive in. On, a, on an ongoing basis. Now, the other thing about protein that's really interesting, I think, is it doesn't, you don't need to think in terms of meal to meal, like 30 grams this meal, 30 grams of that meal, 40 grams of that meal. Let's see, that's 100 grams, Mark. Is that enough? But protein is more like, um, because, it, because there's this reservoir of amino, amino acids in the body, the, your protein intake is more based on uh, a four-day rolling average right? You don't need to go meal to meal. You don't even need to go day to day. But if every four days or every week, you can look back and say, well, I averaged 100 grams a day for that. One day I had 200. Oh my goodness, look at me. And another day I only had 30 because I was trying to eat light. It doesn't, the body, the body adapts to that. It acclimates to that. It has resources in which to allocate and preserve amino acid, uh, an amino acid pool within the body that it can then um, utilize as needed without you having to think consciously, okay, every meal, uh, the body can't process more than 30 grams of protein at any one meal. Does that mean I'm, if I have 60, I'm, uh, no. It, 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 again, we're getting too granular. We're overthinking this. Protein is just, like I, I eat fractally now, right? So I eat, some days I eat one meal a day. Some days I eat two meals a day. Some days I don't eat. Sometimes when I travel to Europe, I have breakfast. It's like, it feels like the thing to do. Plus it's included in the price of the room. So why am I, right? So, <laughs> so I mean, and, and the beauty of that is I'm not tethered to any particular meal time or any particular structured eating strategy because having developed metabolic flexibility by, by being pr predominantly getting rid of industrial seed oils, corn oil, soybean oil, uh, uh, safflower, sunflower, canola, by cutting out sugars and processed carbs, my carb intake, if I try, doesn't exceed 150 grams, maybe 200 grams a day, right? So because I'm metabolically flexible, I can go into these um, days, uh, rarely weeks, because it just gets uncomfortable, but days at a time where I'm off, I'm off the program. I'm off the reservation. I'm like, but I'm in Europe and I'm having great food and I might even have some dessert, not a lot, but some. Uh, and that's me wanting to enjoy my life. And that's the hedonistic part of me saying, you know, I worked hard to develop this metabolic flexibility. Why would I be so restrictive from meal to meal that, that I don't take advantage of the exact thing that metabolic flexibility affords me, which is to be able to go off track once in a while. It, it just makes sense. Why do you do that? You yeah. just you just make so much sense, Mark. Yeah. All right, so we've covered a lot of ground here. We've talked about, you know, in the spirit of longevity, nutrition with an emphasis being protein. We've talked about muscle. We've talked about play. We've talked about the importance of caring for our feet. Is there anything else that, you know, just within the last couple of years, you've really just kind of seen stand out as like one of the ingredients for our longevity? Um, you know, I just reiterate that that enjoying every moment uh, is is ultimately why we're here. I mean, if you think about, you know, why would I want to live a long life if I look back on it and said, well, I I wished I'd done this in my twenties when I had the opportunity, but I was too busy, you know, doing other stuff. Um, I, I I think it's Martha Stewart who who said this, but other people have said it. You know, life is what happens when you're making plans for the future. Right. And and so don't let life pass you by and and um, tr trying to extract the greatest amount of enjoyment out of each moment has been something that I've had to learn for myself because I grew up in a Puritan work ethic fishing village in Maine. Right. And it was life was tough and you had to grind it out and you had to work for everything. And and uh, so that was that was pretty much my mentality for much of my life and there you know there's a utility in that in that philosophy but on the other hand why are we here we're here to we're you know we're here for a finite amount of time um i look at people in the biohacking movement and say i want to live to 160 or i want to live i don't want to live to i don't need to live to 160 
I've, I've had a great time on this earth. I'm not saying I'm ready to go, but at some point I'm like, the, the finiteness of life is what gives it meaning. Mm. And so recognizing that life is finite, looking back and saying, okay, I, I extracted every possible moment I could, you know, that was a, that was a win, right? My life was a win. I love it. I love it. Mark, this is so fascinating. And, you know, if I could, since I have you here, I want to ask you if you can give us a template for exercise, because obviously there's a lot of different inputs. Mm -hmm. You put an emphasis on play, but with play alone or with somebody's like diehard, like yoga is their jam, yeah. right? And they're just like, this is how I'm getting my fitness. We know that we need a variety of these different inputs, just like with everything else. So. Yeah. Can you give us a framework of what a, a, an ideal week would look like as far as our exercise and training? Yeah, so you know, I, I wrote 20 years ago uh, that I described the primal blueprint and the 10 primal blueprint laws, and one of one of the the exercise hierarchy was move around a lot at a low level of activity. What that means is walk, walk or hike or ride a bike or but but walking counts just as much as anything else. And walking is not about burning calories. It's about the movement. It's about using your feet to to cover different uh, planes and ranges of motion and terrains and to and to let the feet inform the rest of the body how to, again how to how to flex the ankle, how to bend the knee, how to torque the hip. Uh, how to adjust for the eccentric motion of, of braking. So move around a lot at a low level of activity. What does that look like? It looks like five hours a week, right? Um, may sound like a lot to some people. Well, I can't run five hours a week. Don't. Walk a half hour someday, an hour another day, ride a bike a little bit. Five hours, get, you, you can get that in. Um, go to the gym twice a week. Now when I say go to the gym, if, you're, if your jam is uh, body weight exercises, at, uh, at the local park where they have a parkour or they have a swing set set up or whatever. But go to the gym twice a week and what we call lift heavy things. Lift heavy things twice a week. And not two days in a row because you want to get time in between to build the muscle, recover, get stronger as a result of having done that. So a couple of days in between. So at least twice a week. Some people are, are going to go to the gym four times a week. Okay, if you can handle that, fine. But my minimum strategy, again, move around a lot at a low level of activity, lift heavy things twice a week, and sprint once a week. Why sprint? Well, again, if we're, if we're calling upon our ancestral recipe, our uh, ancestors uh, had to either run for their lives once in a while, uh, either to get away from something that was going to kill them or to run towards something that they needed to eat and, it, and get the heart rate up to a max level. Um, and again, not not a lot. I mean, uh, I'm going to say four to eight sets of 30 seconds is plenty. And people find that it's the it's one of the most productive workouts they'll do. And you don't have to like give minimal rest in between. You could rest a minute, two minutes, three minutes in between. But once a week, sprint. It's so funny because again, on, I, I saw something uh, Huberman Lab did this the other day. He he made a big deal about this new revelation that we have to do something that get, elevates our heart once a week for 60 seconds. I'm like, dude, I've been talking about that for 20 years. It's, and, and I'm not the only one. Humanity's been talking about that for 2 million years. So, but you, we talked early on about, you know, where we headed as a society and AI and virtual worlds and all this stuff. And, you know, if we just go back and look at what nature, how, how we were, how we evolved through this crucible of scarcity and harsh climate, our genes still expect that of yes. us in order to thrive, in order to be the best that we can be. So if you can sprint once a week, just like your ancestors had to sprint, if you can go to the gym uh, twice a week and lift heavy things, or go to the park and do your body weight exercise, whatever, and if you can move around as much as you can throughout the day at a low level of activity without ever paying attention to the amount of calories you burned, or the steps, please, steps, um, just the time, you know, um, you are 85% of your way to being as fit as you could be. Love it. I love it. Simple recipe and packed with goodness. Now, what about with the sprinting? We we're talking about, you know, getting outside, yep. you know, maybe sprinting on a football field or yeah. track or what about, what about a cycle or something? If somebody's so sprinting, I, I use the term uh, generically and broadly, uh, sprinting for most people, they think, you know, um, on a track. But sprinting for me would be 
the assault bike, right, at the gym, or the Versa climber at the gym, or the, uh, the even on the treadmill walking really hard up a 15 degree incline, you know, or the elliptical, uh, there's or the swimming pool, or there's so many ways that the idea isn't to sprint like Usain Bolt. The idea is to do whatever it is using as many body parts as possible to get the heart rate up yeah. to the highest you can get it for 20, 30, 40 seconds. Sometimes, yeah. I mean, I do I do rope pulls now. I don't know if you've ever seen the rope pull machine, mm -hmm. but we do 60 seconds of rope pull. It's the highest I've ever gotten my heart rate up. It's it's, Holy it's moly. crazy. I never thought to do sprint like oh, yeah, yeah. Sprint no, for sure, for sure. That, yeah. No, you put it on you put it on level one like yeah. the least amount of resistance, and you pull for time and yeah. for for I mean for distance for a minute. Oh, it's incredible. So. Uh, all these all these methods of sprinting are are a, a way of raising your heart rate up to and again if you have you know if you're coming from uh an untrained uh situation if you have you know bad knees or bad heart look don't i'm not telling you to do that you got to train into that but if you're relatively fit and you want to get fitter there's nothing like sprints that'll that'll cut you up Boom. and it cut you up meaning burn, <laughs> burn body fat that's right yeah. that's right Mark, you remind me of this statement that success leaves clues, you know, and so thank you so much for all that you've done these past years and, you know, just really creating a model for us, you know, and speaking about longevity, like you have that thing, you know, and so I'm really excited anytime I get a chance to talk to you. Could you let people know where to connect with you sure. and also mention your new shoe company again? Yep. So um, my Instagram is Mark Sisson Primal. Um, I haven't been good about uh, posting shots recently, but I will. I, people seem to like my shirtless shots for the seven, seventy year old guy on, on Marxist and Primal on Instagram. Um, Mark's Daily Apple is the blog. I've uh, been writing since 2006 daily. Uh, that's where a lot of the good, really good researched information is. And the footwear company is called Peluva, P E L U V A, Peluva.com. Hey, if you like this video, make sure to check out this video right here. Men and menopausal women probably have the easiest transition to fasting because their hormones, there's not as much fluctuation. If you're already lean and you're still at peak fertility years, so 35 and under, you have to be careful about when you're fasting.